Welcome back to another instalment of New Zealand's Bird of the Week, where in this video I will be talking about the North slash South Island Peel Peel, generalist bird said to have among the most beautiful bird song in the country, though now being extinct. I hope you enjoy. Occurring in both the North and South Islands, as well as a few offshore ones, Peel Peel, being about 26 centimetres in length and weighing about 130 grams, were otherwise known as the New Zealand thrushes, though their resemblance was only a passing one, and were in fact, until recently, a big taxonomic mystery. Until 2011, they were regarded only by the monotypic family, Tunagridae, as Incart Sedis or Uncertain Placement, and were potentially thought to be close relatives to the Australian whistlers or the bowerbird, being thought to be especially close to catbirds due to the latter having a similar appearance, though it was hard to find support for either, and so the classification remains in limbo for a while. The aforementioned 2011 paper found that from analysing sequence data from three nuclear introns, that's the birds were all three times indicators to be closest to orioles. Their exact position within the group is more uncertain, though in the combined analysis, they were largely found to cluster in a more basal position than to the rest of them. Tying back to their genus name, it's funny now to look back and see that it was actually incorrect, even back then, on two counts, both on their relationships to other birds, and interestingly enough, to geography. Their genus name of Tunagra is both a combination of Turdus, Thrushes, and Tanagra, the American Tanagers, which is repeated for the North Island species' name as well. Anders Sparman, who described the South Island Peel Peel in 1787, mistakenly believed the specimen had come from the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, hence them being given the species name of Capensis. Given that in scientific nomenclature, a name, once allocated validly to a new species, can't be changed, they're stuck with a name, at least scientifically, which is not fitting in the slightest. It was found that they diverged from these birds about 20 million years ago, with said divergence time also making it clear that Peel Peel must have arrived in New Zealand by dispersal across the Tasman Sea, and not as a result of Icarians when New Zealand separated from Gondwana in the late Cretaceous. The two species of Pio Pio, the North and South Island birds, were generally similar in appearance, though with some differences to be noted. Birds were generally olive brown in colour, having rufous wings and tails, alongside a speckled breast, with the North Island birds having a more greyish head and the South Island birds having a more mottled brown undersize. There was also a smaller subspecies of the South Island birds that lived on Stephens Island, which was a fair bit smaller, having a streaked crown and being more rufous on the head and wings. In terms of their diets, it was noted that Peel Peel were omnivorous, feeding on a wide variety of food items much like their oriole relatives, ranging from insects, worms, alongside berries and fruits. In contrast though, unlike living orioles which rarely descended to the ground to feed, appeared to have done so very often, shifting around dry leaves and other forest debris, as well as hawking for insects over bodies of water or in open areas. They were also very tame, with birds coming out from bushes and eating food given to them out of people's hands with no worries with 40 plus birds at any one time occasionally surrounding a camp, apparently taking a great liking to cooked potato and to raw meat. Captive birds were also in the presence of other birds, in one case a pair of Australian ring doves, were watched carefully by the Pio Pio in the same aviary, and when the eggs were laid by the doves, they would almost immediately dart upon the nest and eat them, continuing to do so as the dove laid more eggs before having to be moved elsewhere. Of all their traits, their calls were among the most distinctive, with their melodies being described as being very pleasant and sweet, and described by most ornithologists of the time as unquestionably the best of the country's songsters, having a powerful, melodic song with tuneful phrasing and even some cases of mimicry. Their main call was a short and sharp whistling cry which was quickly repeated, being the source of their name, with the full song consisting of five distinct bars, each being repeated six to seven times in succession. While tragically, no recording of the birds themselves exists, there was a recording done of a human imitation that made in 1952 by Henry Halmanner, who conveyed, though roughly, what they would have sounded like in life. Sid's call was mainly heard in the early mornings and evenings, and often continued after the dawn chorus was finished often spreading their tail out and hopping from side to side in an enthusiastic display. They were also observed to also be the most lively during or immediately preceding a shower of rain, being keen mimickers, some of their notes being scarcely distinguishable from yellowheads, and even the introduced Australian magpie. Very little was known about their breezing, though they were apparently monogamous, with the laying occurring sometime in late December, also noted to be territorial and being seen in pairs. They would make a cup-shaped nest of small dry twigs with bark and moss, which was lined with grass and tree ferns, which was placed about three metres above the ground, often in the fork of a small branch. 
Clutches seem to have been about two eggs, which were pinkish whites with dark brown blotches, with both adults being seen to defend their young from any perceived threats. Pio Pio remains common throughout New Zealand's forests until the mid 1800s, until mass deforestation throughout the country, particularly the lowlands, removed a massive swath of the habitats, and, along with an influx of new predators, mainly European rats, further devastated the now more fragmented populations. The last verified North Island Pio Pio to be seen was shot in 1902, and the South Island birds last being recorded in 1905, though some sightings were documented as late as the 1970s, throughout areas like Taranaki and Gisborne in the North Island and in Nelson in the South, though much of them remain inconclusive. The last stronghold of the North Island birds appears to have been the area that later became the Whanganui National Park, as well as around the Haohungaroa west of Lake Taupo. They remain quite common on the west coast and fjordlands due to its more rugged and remote geography, though the introduction of stoats in the early 1880s brought a sudden end to this, and they were noted to have heavily declined there in a short time, becoming extinct in the region by about 1895. The Stephens Islands population, which could well have been spared to the same phase given its remoteness, was unfortunately not able to continue to carry the now heavily endangered birds, as has many other offshore islands like with Hihi and Saddleback, since people eventually did arrive there, clearing a lot of the island's forest cover and introducing cats which multiplied well into the hundreds, wiping them out by about 1898. Plans to move the birds to predator-free islands like Little Barrier and Kapiti Islands were unfortunately mooses, either because they were just never acted on or were derailed due to the lack of suitable sanctuaries at the time, especially considering that the live capture of birds was very difficult before the invention of the now widely used and efficient mist nets. So through both ignorance and a lack of understanding, Pio Pio now remain lost to time, something made all the more sad considering we'll never truly hear their apparently spectacular and unique songs. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of New Zealand's Bird of the Week. For next time, you are able to vote for the Pukeko, widespread and brightly coloured rails that have benefited greatly by the clearing of lands for agriculture. With that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.